Tēnā koutou katoa. Ngā mahi nui ki a koutou katoa, kā ranga mai, mahi mai. Um, ko Kali Mercy a toko ingoa. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the New Zealand Drug Foundation. Uh, welcome to all the wonderful people joining us today. We've just got the uh, panellists joining one by one at the moment. Um, it looks like most people are in the in the um, are listening in now though, so I'm going to get started. Um, a especially warm welcome just to start to those people in Auckland um, who we've all just learned are going into uh, level three lockdown again from midday today. So um, big sympathy to you guys uh, and thank you for joining us despite the uproar. Um, so just a quick introduction to the Drug Foundation. Um, we're a charitable trust. We're independent of the government and we're based here in Wellington. Um, and one of our many roles is to facilitate community conversations around uh, topics relating to drug law. And there is, of course, this little thing coming up called the referendum on, to legalise cannabis um, on the 19th of September as part of our general election. Um, and for more than 30 years, the Drug Foundation has been promoting health-based approaches to drug use um, rather than criminal-based approaches. So we've watched as the world around us has moved, I guess, ever forwards towards these health-based approaches rather than criminal approaches. Um, and we've taken some baby steps towards that ourselves as well. But this, this referendum that we've got coming up now um, is one of those really major steps that could have a really positive and, and big impact for us by uh, reducing convictions, by allowing us to put in some uh, policy and regulatory controls around the way that we control cannabis use and, and the way that we treat people who use cannabis in this country. So um, while we wouldn't necessarily have chosen the referendum route to go down, um, the way for us was pretty clear in terms of um, us having to take a leading role um, in, in the referendum in, in helping the country to understand why um, regulation is the best possible way to control cannabis in our country. Um, so if we want a chance to reduce harmful or heavy use over time, if we want a chance to reduce convictions, if we want to ensure that our products are safe and to put new investment into health and education, um, then legalisation and promoting a yes vote at the referendum was really a no-brainer for us. Um, and the bill we'll be voting on in September really does tick all our boxes in terms of taking an evidence-based uh, public health approach. So it's great to be able to hold this webinar. Uh, it's co-hosted by the Helen Clark Foundation uh, and by the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Um, and, and the topic is uh, a, the case for legalization, um, a conversation with the Global Commission on Drug Policy. And we are very, very lucky to have these amazing speakers with us today. Um, and Holly is going to introduce um, them properly in a moment, but I just wanted to say how excited I am to have you here today um, and how I'm really looking forward to hearing how, um, how our referendum fits within the international context. Uh, and, you know, just in terms of are we an, an international outlier or are we part of, of a more international move towards, you know, um, treating drugs as a health use? How does our legalisation of cannabis potentially fit within that international context? I'm also keen to hear what you think about Bill as well. So um, Holly is going to introduce you guys just properly in a second, but just a couple of Zoom housekeeping uh, things. Firstly, I think most people are very um, wise as to how to use uh, Zoom webinars by now, but just so you, in case you don't know, uh, we can't see the audience, um, we can't hear you, but you can talk to us through the Q&A function. If you have a question for the panelists, please put that into the Q&A um, function. And if you want to talk more generally to other people who are watching, you can go into the chat. Uh, and we've got people sitting, um, helping out on the moderation. We've got Alana, we've got Tom, uh, and we've got Kathy from the Helen Clark Foundation as well. And we've also got uh, Khalid joining us from the Global Commission on Drug Policy in Geneva. It's midnight there, so thanks for joining us, Khalid. Um, we will be recording this session, so you'll be able to watch it afterwards on um, New Zealand Drug Foundation's website um, and our YouTube channel as well, um, in case you want to send anyone else along to watch. Um, and we're going through to 12.15. So um, Holly, I'm gonna hand over to you now to get cracking with the talk. Um, Holly is the Deputy Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, she served in Parliament as a Green MP between 2011 and 2014. And as well as being Deputy Director of the Helen Clark Foundation, she is also an author and children's advocate. So welcome Holly and over to you. Well, kia ora, Kali. Thank you very much. And ngā mahi nui kia koutou uh, katoa. Uh, no mai hare mai ki tēnei hui. Um, welcome, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. And um, 
Thank you very much. As Carly said, I'm the Deputy Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, we're an independent public policy think tank founded on the values espoused by our patron, Helen Clark, who's of course with us today throughout her career. And um, as a foundation, we're committed to evidence-based uh, public policy discussion that advances fairness and democracy and sustainability in Aotearoa, New Zealand and internationally. Um, and this issue of drug policy reform was one we looked at very early after the founding of the foundation um, in 2019. One of our first reports uh, was entitled The Case for Yes, which looked at the evidence um, uh, in favour of uh, cannabis law reform and for a yes vote in the referendum. So we're very pleased to be here today and I'm very pleased to be uh, your facilitator. I'm now going to introduce our esteemed uh, panelists and then we'll get into um, the discussion. So first of all, we have the Right Honourable he Helen Clark, who will of course be no stranger to our New Zealand audience. Uh, Helen served three successive terms as Prime Minister of New Zealand between 1999 and 2008, and then she then became the United Nations Development Programme Administrator for two terms from 2009 to 2017, and she was the first woman to lead that organisation. Uh, she's also been the chair of the United Nations Development Group, which is a committee consisting of the heads of all the UN funds, programs and departments that work on development issues. And she now engages in public advocacy across a range of issues which motivated her career in public service, including, of course, as the patron of our foundation. We're also joined by Louise Arbour, who has had a distinguished career in the law and international human rights. She served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2004 to 2008. And as Special Representative of the Secretary General for International Migration from 2016 to 2018, uh, she's also served on the Supreme Court of Canada, which is her native country, from 1999 to 2004, and was President and CEO of the International Crisis Group from 2009 until 2014. And she's been a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy since 2011. Also with us is President Juan Manuel Santos, uh, former president of Colombia. He served two terms uh, from 2010 until 2018 as the president of Colombia, during which time he was intensely focused on achieving peace and reconciliation and ending armed combat. Um, and his tenacious pursuit of that peace was recognized when he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. Prior to his presidency, he served as Colombia's Minister of Trade, Finance and Defense, and he's also worked previously as a journalist, editor, and as the author of several books. And finally, Jeff Gallup joins us. Jeff Gallup was first elected to the Western Australian Parliament in 1986, and he's held many political roles and ministerial portfolios during his political career, um, culminating in his election as leader of the Western Australian Labor Party in 1996 and premier of Western Australia in 2011, uh, 2001. Sorry. After leaving politics in 2006, he took up the position of Professor and Director of the Graduate School of Government at the University of Sydney, which he held until his retirement five years ago, and he's held many other national and international appointments and honours, um, and a real through line of his career has been a strong interest in harm reduction and health approaches to drug policy. So I think you'll agree, a very distinguished um, international panel, we're, we're honoured to have you all with us. Um, Thank you all very much for sharing your time and expertise um, and we're really looking forward to the discussion that we'll have this morning. So I'm going to start with a question for you, Helen. Um, you have said in, in talking about this issue that good drug policy can sometimes be counterintuitive. So I think that opens us up really nicely for an interesting discussion. If you can tell us what do you mean by that and, and what do you think are the most compelling reasons for a change uh, in the current law? Well, firstly, thanks so much to the colleagues from the Global Commission on Drug Policy for joining in the discussion today on this very important referendum on cannabis legalisation and control in New Zealand. I really appreciate Louise Abour from Canada, Juan Manuel Santos from Colombia, and Jeff Gallup from uh, uh, West Australia and now the East Coast of Australia uh, joining us today. And thanks to the uh, Commission in Geneva, Khalid and colleagues for organising and the Drug Foundation and the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, so for me, the most compelling reasons for advocating for a yes vote are simply social justice and fairness. We have legislation which uh, penalises, uh, in particular, Indigenous people in our country who are three times more likely to be uh, arrested and convicted on cannabis charges and to get caught up then in that spiral of the criminal justice system, which, is, as we know, can 
and blight lives uh, uh, from from then on, uh, endangering uh, prospects for for work, uh, for for travel. Uh, it, it's a slippery slope once you get caught up in, in that system. And caught up for what? At the Commission, we published report after report citing the scientific evidence on cannabis. We look at the weighted risks, the weighted potential for harm of cannabis vis-a-vis -vis the legal drugs of alcohol and tobacco. We find tobacco immensely more lethal, deadly. Uh, no one ever died of a cannabis overdose, to the best of my knowledge. People die every day in our countries of the cancers and, and other uh, diseases caused by uh, tobacco smoking. We look at the harm uh, created by alcohol. Uh, any weighted uh, ranking of harm by cannabis just isn't on that scale. So here we are in a situation where uh, the international consensus for decades was that cannabis was a bad thing and it had to be prohibited. These other things could, could go on. This is ridiculous. But the prohibitionist publicity has been very, very strong. And often why I say it's counterintuitive is you're coming up against decades of propaganda that said this is a bad thing. People who use this drug are bad people. They have to be punished, almost dehumanized, actually, often in the way they, they are treated if they are using uh, drugs that are, are not legal. So uh, time to turn that around and say, what are we really dealing with here? In the case of cannabis, it is a very widely used drug for recreation in New Zealand. Uh, one of the longitudinal studies from our Otago University suggested that up to 80% of New Zealanders will use it at some point in their lifetimes. Clearly, if, if the state tried to criminalize the 80%, there'd be none of us at work would be sitting in a jail. So it, it, it is ridiculous. And we have a chance on the 19th of September in our referendum to say no to ridiculous law, which, which brings the law into disrespect, which is never a good thing in any case, and to say, let's be rational about this. Uh, we are not dealing here with some crazy, stupid thing that's killing people. We're dealing with a commonly used drug, uh, which should be regulated in the same way as we regulate tobacco. And the legislation that we have to vote on in the referendum uh, actually builds on all the experience we've had with, with tobacco. We don't want big cannabis operating here the way big tobacco uh, operated. Uh, we have a, a proposed law, which is a New Zealand solution, which stops any big corporate getting control of the whole market and would en enable economic development in our uh, less um, uh, affluent regions uh, where this product can be easily cultivated and, and grown. We're looking at, at an outcome uh, which could see the state uh, Treasury uh, gain uh, close to half a billion dollars in tax revenue. Look, in, in the current COVID-19 scenarios, I'd grab half a billion in tax revenue uh, from uh, a legalized cannabis uh, industry. So there's just so many reasons for saying the time is now to act on this. And that's what I'm really asking New Zealanders to do. Look at the evidence, uh, see the benefits of getting this legalized and controlled and out of the hands of those who currently uh, benefit from a legal sale. And unfortunately, that is organized crime. Mm. Thank you. You mentioned there the way that um, the law criminalizes um, many people and in an unequal way often. And I'd like to put this next question to Louise Arbour as a former prosecutor and a judge and a Supreme Court justice. Um, you, Louise, would have a unique first-hand perspective on that um, connection between cannabis prohibition and the justice system. And one of the arguments in favour of legalisation here, which Helen has just made, is that relatively minor offences like possession and cultivation can clog up the justice system and create a pathway into prison, especially for Māori and Indigenous people. Um, so I'm interested to know, was this your observation in your time as a lawyer and a judge in Canada? And how do you think a move to legalise and regulate cannabis could improve the working and outcomes of our justice system? Thank you. And let me say, um, when I was first approached uh, to join this panel, I had a dream for a fraction of a second that this could actually bring me to New Zealand. Very unfortunately, like the rest of you, I'm sitting at home 
And if you hear noise in the background, it's either a dog or some grandchildren. But anyway, I'm really delighted to be with you. And I'll just start by echoing, I think, some of the comments that Helen made about, particularly in this day and age, in any field, the need to return to sober science-based policy making in public policy, it is critical. I think that we free ourselves from stereotypes and ideological position, and we take a hard look at where we are on a science basis. And, and a science-based approach, I think, requires that, uh, particularly in the criminal justice system, it's very tempting uh, to move immediately to prohibition and to engage law enforcement. Uh, to either eradicate or reduce what are perceived some science-based approach requires that we look at the anticipated or intended benefits and the foreseeable disadvantages or harm caused by engaging the criminal justice system. And I think for a long time, that's what we did not do appropriately. And this is anchored, of course, in the now more than 50-year-old war on drugs uh, that internationally and in most of our countries kind of set the framework for a regime that intended, it's always well-intentioned, it intended to discourage or actually eliminate production, trade and consumption of a whole variety of substances. Interestingly, as Helen pointed out, not alcohol and not tobacco. And cannabis, I think, got caught up in the classification of these prohibited drugs. Where this has left us, and I think country after country, we've come to realize that the actual harm caused by law enforcement, particularly with respect to personal use or personal cultivation for, for personal consumption of cannabis, there's more harm caused by the law enforcement system than by the actual use, which is rarely uh, drug abuse. Recreational use of cannabis is very widespread. Now, I first came across these issues um, actually as an academic in Canada in criminal law and then as a judge. But more recently, I can speak to that as a citizen of Canada, a country that has actually decriminalized and regulated uh, the use of cannabis now about a year and a half ago. And I'd just like maybe to point out where this has left us. First of all, it is correcting the discriminatory effects of law enforcement in cannabis uh, criminalization that Helen has alluded to. From so far away, we experience exactly the same kind of um, discriminatory targeting of indigenous peoples in Canada, grossly overrepresented in prison compared to their proportion of the general population. And actually the harm the stigmatization and harm that it caused to many young people, particularly uh, people who may not have had the means and the social status uh, to engage prosecutorial discretion and avoid conviction. So, um, but maybe I could just say a few words and we could come back to that if there's any interest of where we are now in Canada with the use of cannabis being not only not criminal, but regulated. The interesting thing for those who are interested in options when it comes to regulation is that, as you may know, uh, we have a very similar political background in Canada and in New Zealand, except for the fact that we are a federation. Criminal law is federal jurisdiction. So decriminalization was a decision of the government of Canada. But regulation is very much in the hand of the provinces and territories. So we have a variety of models to look at. Some may end up working better than others. For instance, in the province of Quebec, where I live, uh, the sale of cannabis products, and let me tell you, they are a huge variety of products, uh, is done by a, a, a state entity in the same way that alcohol is. So there's, but it's not sold with alcohol. It is completely controlled by government. In some provinces, the legal age for purchase and consumption is 18, in other places it's 21. It's a big debate about how to best target and discourage um, young people from consuming. Um, a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half into decriminalization, Canada claims to have captured 
currently about 30% of the illegal drug market. Now, cannabis, as you know, and I don't know the situation in New Zealand, is very different from other particularly synthetic drugs. Not all the sale and distribution was in the hands of uh, organized crime. Some was. Some was just a cottage industry. So what has been recaptured is not 100% uh, of that sort of illegal, sometimes hardcore criminal market of cannabis distribution. So the taxation revenues and so on are starting to come in. At the beginning, I think the, the pricing, the government priced itself, not in a competitive way with the criminal market. So users um, often continue to go to their own sources. When it comes to regulation, there are tons of issues uh, that have to be examined. And as I said, I hope that the those who are moving in that direction can look at the lot of experimentation that's taking place in, in uh, Canada. The one thing I want to flag is very much what Helen said. Bad laws or laws that are unjust, that are generally, not generally, but widely disregarded, enforced in uh, discretionary and very often discriminatory fashions, erode the whole foundation of the rule of law. It's very costly, I think, to stick to um, law. It's not a question of whether these laws are popular or not, but if there's not enough social buy-in and where the harm, uh, I think, is vastly, the harm from drug use, never mind drug abuse, is disproportionate compared to the harm caused by law enforcement. It's critical to move away um, and to move to the system we have. And maybe find it just as an introduction, the legalization and regulation of cannabis purchase and use and so on has been the non-event of the year. Uh, essentially very little change. Um, uh, the market, as I said, has moved to legal purchase. The products, there are lots of debates, for instance, about uh, whether it should be sold in candy form. It's now sold not only in smokable products, but in oils and sprays and liquids and now edible, all kinds of edible products. Um, there was a lot of fear in law enforcement at the beginning, in my opinion, strangely, with an increased potential for impaired driving by cannabis consumption. This is bizarre. I mean, the pe people used cannabis before, and as Helen pointed out, there's virtually no documented case of uh, overdose or fatalities or um, in any event, there's been no change whatsoever, I think in the general uh, use and consumption, except we are now in a much safer, much better regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating to hear um, about some of that recent experience in Canada. And I think um, looking at some of the questions coming in, we might come back to you um, to ask you some more about that, Louise, when we get to the question and answer um, part of our discussion. Uh, but I'd like to move now to um, pre former President Juan Manuel Santos from Colombia. Um, because I'm, and you mentioned, Louise, about organized crime, and I think that's something really interesting to pick up here. Obviously, the context in Colombia is very different from that in New Zealand, in, in that that so called war on drugs really largely took place on on your soil there. Um, and during your time in office, you worked really hard to reform drug policy in that very difficult context of violence and criminal, criminal cartels and organized crime, uh, which, is, which is very different from the situ situation we have here in New Zealand. But one thing that we do perhaps have in common is that the supply of cannabis here is um, to, a, to a reasonably large extent controlled by organized crime. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on the potential of legalization and regulation of cannabis to undermine the criminal gangs that often control that lucrative drug market. Thank you. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, very distinguished panel on an issue that is very important for the whole world. And I try to illustrate the problem with an anecdote that appears in the uh, last uh, biography of uh, Winston Churchill by Andrew Roberts. Uh, he describes how Winston Churchill went uh, through Canada and arrived in California 
during prohibition. And he asked for a drink, for a whiskey. And they told him, no, Mr. Churchill, this is prohibited here. And he said, what a strange country this is, referring to the United States during prohibition. Um, in this country, you give these enormous profits from the sale of liquor to organized crime, to the mafias. In my country, we give it to the treasury. And I think this uh, demonstrates the, the core of the problem. Colombia, my country, has been the country that has paid the highest price uh, in this war on drugs since it was declared uh, been over 50 years ago. We have lost our best leaders, our best journalists, our best judges, our best policemen, and we still are the first provider of cocaine to the world markets uh, and uh, the marijuana is still part of the problem. And the word prohibition is the one that has uh, in a way uh, caused all these problems and all this violence. Uh, part of the war that we were able to stop was fed by uh, drug trafficking and by the violence and the money out of this business. So we went against the whole chain of the drug trafficking uh, when I was Minister of Finance, when I was Minister of Defense and as President. And uh, I learned uh, the hard way, uh, and that's why I am uh, now a member of the Global Commission on Drugs, that the prohibition is what is causing all the problems. You're not going to do away with the consumption of drugs, but you can regulate it uh, and take away from the organized crime, from the violence, uh, those profits, and invest them in uh, a health approach and in educating the public. And uh, you even would have some funds left over for other activities, because the cost for a country like Colombia in this war on drugs has been enormous, enormous. And uh, I am absolutely convinced that if we are able to regulate the, the market, take away the profits from organized crime, and the state takes control of those profits, then uh, the problem will be diminished uh, to a very, very small problem of health uh, and sometimes uh, uh, law and order, but uh, it will be very, very small compared to what we have right now. And we're seeing that all around the world. So I am, because of the experience that I had and the suffering that my country has had, I am absolutely convinced that the only way to solve this problem, which is a world problem, the consumption of drugs and drug trafficking is not a, a, a problem of one country or two countries or three countries. It's a problem, a worldwide problem. The only way is to change the paradigm, change the approach, and uh, from prohibition, change to regulation. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's really great to hear. Um, and and I want to pick up on something you said there around um, what what can be done with the revenue from taxation, because I think it's important to note that um, the bill that we are voting on here in our referendum. Um, specifically provides for that revenue to be used on um, education and health harm reduction measures. So um, I think it's a really important point you've made and useful for people to know that that ties well with what's proposed in the referendum. Um, I'd like to move to Jeff Gallup now, who um, also has some unique experience um, in this issue. During, during Jeff's time as the Premier of Western Australia, uh, he presided a very unique experiment of decriminalizing personal use of cannabis in 2004, um, which was done hand in hand with the police uh, force in WA. So Jeff, could you tell us about, um, I guess, the genesis of this experiment and what happened? What, what did people, what were people expecting to happen and, and what actually played out um, yep. when you did this? Thanks very much. And uh, it's, it's a great privilege to be with such distinguished people talking about an important issue 
Indeed, could I start by making the observation, listening to the three previous speakers, that what, what we're really focused on with an issue uh, like this in New Zealand and, and Canada and, and, and in Australia is the way we approach public policy. And, and there is a war going on out there at the moment in, in, in our world between those who say, you know, prejudice is enough. You, you, as long as you've got your prejudice, you've got your views, that's it. You don't need to examine any further. There might be fundamentalists. In other, words, in other words, they have a belief independent of the consequences of the application of that belief. Or, or indeed, they have a very simple view. And I think it's all of us that are involved in these campaigns to change the law in respect of drugs in general and cannabis in particular, is to get some common sense into the system uh, and understanding what the evidence is uh, to tackle prejudice and stigma against people, which prevents them from necessarily, uh, uh, prevents them from taking up support they need with health conditions that they may have, etc. So this is not just an issue, if you like, about one area of public policy. This is about the way you approach public policy. And I guess if I go back to my own experience, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the forces against change base their argument on very simplistic propositions. And, and the strength of the argument that we have on our side of the uh, argue, uh, 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 of the position is that we're trying to bring some complexity into it, some nuance, understanding of human nature, a pragmatic approach, uh, health-based, rights-based into the into the equation. And I found that it, when we were in opposition, developing our policy, uh, getting some feeders from the community about what they thought, really they were ready for change. And I think when a community is ready for change, it's very important that the politicians come in and back that up. Cynicism is bred of inaction. And I, and I think in the case, we, we, we made it clear to the people that we were going to do this. We said it was wrong that particularly young people would get caught up in the criminal justice system. And uh, we've had the arguments earlier tonight on, on, on that issue. We said that was wrong. So we, we then came up with a view of having um, uh, the whole issue taken out of the criminal system and, and a system of uh, civil penalties, fines, just like a, a speeding fine or, or, or whatever. We found that the opposition to us was very strong in the election campaign. Major uh, advertisements just before the election saying that if you vote for uh, the Labor side of politics, my party, uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of people going into drug use. You're going to have, have more health problems. You're going to have a gateway to the use of heroin. You know, all of the argument. Very powerful arguments. And they said this was the key issue in in the election. And of course, we won the election. And then to, to make sure that we're absolutely convinced of the uh, support we had for a common sense approach, we had a drug summit. 80 out of the 100 people on the drug summit came from the general community. They proposed a whole range of things in respect of drug policy. Uh, but the one that, of course, we were interested in was where they recommended uh, what we had said was the best way, it's a system of civil penalties. And so we, we, we affirmed our support, uh, the support we had in the community. Then we had the expert panel, just as you will in New Zealand, uh, that will follow on uh, of a yes vote to get the detail. And never forget the detail is everything uh, in these matters. It's always difficult. Each model is going to be different from another one. And then we introduced it. What were the consequences? Well, the consequences were there was no radical uh, increase in the use of cannabis. Uh, 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 in our society, uh, I think the community was was more relaxed about itself. There was more; it was more tolerant uh, of the of the uh, choices other people make. Uh, and and thirdly, of course, there was a lot more confidence people had about accessing medical services if they needed it uh, in in relation to uh, their, their cannabis use. So, the fear campaign was proved to be wrong. But there was one thing we didn't do, and I think this is very important. We didn't entrench the argument into our system. And uh, I think this is where Canada's fascinating. Uh, when there were efforts to close down the injecting centre in Vancouver, uh, Canada had its Charter of Rights, and Louise would know a lot about this, which was a bulwark for a health approach to, uh, to drug policy. In Australia, we don't have that. And, and, and the, the opposing party to mine in Western Australia, uh, which uh, eventually came back to government, reversed our policy. I think we've got to try and get those who are more conservatively inclined to see that it's important 
that common sense works in this is in this area, and and that was the one one thing that we didn't do was to entrench it across the political parties so that it was sustained into the future. So I guess my my lessons for the day would be, you know, there is going to be strong opposition because of this fundamentalist prejudiced approach to public policy, uh, and uh, we have to be aware of that. To counter that, I think we need to use the opportunities when they emerge to show that these changes, as, as Louise pointed out, the world doesn't collapse. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect world, but there is such a thing as a better world. And, and by having reforms of this nature, we can do it. If only we get that excellent revenue coming into the government from the proposal that you've got, which will be able to assist in producing uh, uh, better health services. But when that opportunity comes, most important for all of those who who favour a new approach to these things, to grab that opportunity and to make credible what previously was just a, a rhetorical argument. And uh, so all the best to uh, all of you in, in New Zealand. Those of us on the other side of the, uh, 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 the Tasman always say that, you know, there's a lot more reform goes on in, in uh, New Zealand. And we're looking to you once again uh, to lead the way with uh, a legal regulation, which is the, I think the, um, uh, the, light, the light on the hill when it comes to drug law reform. Mm, thank you very much, Jeff. That's um, very inspiring, actually, <laughs> to, hear, to hear you speak in that way. Um, I'd like to move now to some of the many questions that we have coming through from our um, viewers. And thank you all very much for your questions and for the comments I can see popping up in the chat box as well. Um, because we won't have time to get through them all if we go through every individual question, I'll try to, I've been looking at them and trying to identify themes that I see coming through so we can address um, several at one time. And um, in fact, Jeff, you've just spoken there to some of the concerns that I've, I've seen coming up, which are around, um, I guess, how to counter those very strong arguments that people perhaps have internalised for a long time, um, if they have, you know, if they've been very familiar with the sort of fear mongering or very negative um, connotations of cannabis use in the past and, and how to counter that. But one concern that a number of people have raised is that uh, they do feel concerned about the impacts on young people um, in, in particular in terms of brain development and in terms of perhaps Normalize, normalizing cannabis use by legalizing it, um, perhaps encouraging young people to use more cannabis than they would otherwise or use other drugs as well. So I wonder if um, any of, of you panelists would like to comment either from the experience of what you've seen happen in your own countries or evidence that you're familiar with um, of, the, of, of how people's concerns about particularly um, young people can be allayed um, when you're going about a, a reform of this kind. Oh, Helen, you're on mute. <laughs> and one of the points I always make about the referendum is it's not a referendum on whether or not cannabis should be available in New Zealand. Cannabis is available in New Zealand. It's very widely available and it's very widely used. So it is normalised. The problem is that uh, there are, is a proportion of people who, who are using it who are going to end up with a criminal conviction, which is unjust. And as we've described, uh, the burden of that falls very heavily on the, on the Māori uh, community. Uh, so it, it's out there, it's happening, but it's in an illegal and unregulated market. Now, when you legalise and regulate, you get uh, controls around it. And one of the controls, which is proposed in the bill uh, put forward by the New Zealand government, uh, is that there will be an age of sale at 20. And that's taking into account uh, what uh, some of the health evidence suggests that it's not sensible uh, for young people to be consuming it, nor is it sensible for young people to be drinking alcohol, right? And no responsible parent uh, you know, should stand by and, and see their kids doing things that aren't, aren't very sensible. So you can't supply to, uh, to under 20s. Uh, Holly, as you mentioned earlier, there will be a levy uh, on the sale of cannabis, which will be specifically dedicated to uh, funding for health promotion, getting you know, the messages out there uh, about cannabis and not using uh, for, uh, for youth. Uh, it is an, an adult um, uh, pursuit, uh, not, not for young people. And, and also uh, services, because there, there is that small number of, of young people who have had uh, some you know, bad, bad consequence from use, but they shouldn't be using it. 
so I think the key thing is to get a grip on this, to legalize, to regulate, to have a sensible science-informed, evidence-informed uh, discussion about what we're, we're dealing with here. Uh, Louise could uh, comment very usefully, I think, on the Canadian and other North American experiences, but my understanding is that on balance, there's been no great surge of use at all, <laughs> because uh, fundamentally people are using this drug now, regardless of, of the legal status. Uh, so it's, it's not that a whole lot of people are sitting in their front rooms in New Zealand homes thinking, oh, gee, golly gosh, it's, it's legal now, I'm going to go out and buy it. No, 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 no. What, what this is about is ensuring that those who have made the choice to use it don't end up criminalized. Can I, can I uh, simply uh, give you uh, an experience that I had, a very uh, short but very illustrative experience? When I started talking about uh, legalizing marijuana in Colombia, uh, I was attacked politically because this is uh, an issue, as has been said, very easy to to attack and, and, and to make it, uh, to do populism with this issue. And I was in a meeting with many mothers and they said, why are you proposing uh, a legislation to poison our young people, our young kids and our young Colombians? And uh, I was struck by the, the, the accusation. I said, listen, uh, if your daughter or your son is caught with drugs, would you prefer for him to be put in jail or to be taken to an institution if he's an addict and to be cured? And uh, they all said, no, to be taken to an institution if he's an addict and be cured. And I said, that is legalization. That is regulation. Uh, the other one is prohibition. And they all changed their minds. And I think this is very important uh, because it's very easy to make uh, uh, populism with this issue. The hardline approach uh, sometimes is very popular, but is completely ineffective. Holly, if I could just uh, make a point, am I on? Yes, you are. And then yeah, I see yeah. Louise would also like to briefly right. this as well. Fear, fear is a very powerful force uh, in our society. And uh, those who oppose any reform at all uh, uh, find it very easy to say, let's say no, let's say no, let's say no. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world and you can generate a lot of fear uh, around that. That's why I think it's important in these issues to have, you know, uh, the, the academics who research the subject to be able to put on the table the consequences, uh, the, the advocates of, of a proper regulatory framework, learning all that we can from the tobacco experience, and the alcohol experience on how to regulate in a way that will uh, make uh, the health situation of our uh, uh, younger people uh, as secure as, as it is possible in the real world. Uh, so th there's all of those practical things that have been done in the, in the tobacco and alcohol area, not so much in the alcohol area effectively, by the way. I think that's an area where, you know, we do need to have a look at the health consequences in the regulatory systems that we have more carefully. But fear is a powerful thing. And we've just got to mobilise opinion against fear uh, and, and say that we're going to have a better world, a better society if we do this. Be, be, be advocates for a better society, be advocates for reform, not because it's just something that, you know, is convenient, because it genuinely will make it easier to, to sell the argument to young people about health consequences. You take all of the nonsense out of it, you deal with it as a proper issue, and you can get the better outcomes. They're the sorts of things we see in places uh, like uh, the Netherlands and, and, and Switzerland, for example, which haven't, by the way, uh, legally legalized uh, the, uh, cannabis, but they've allowed the system to operate. And, and young people aren't running to have more cannabis. There's, they're in fact, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Louise, and then I'll move on to our next question. Yeah. Okay. I, I will just echo, I think, some of the things that have been been said, and I think the Canadian experience, uh, I haven't looked at all the literature, but it certainly, I think, uh, confirms that legalizing the recreational use of a product doesn't mean that the government will encourage the promotion of use and certainly not the promotion of abuse of the product. At the same time, I think when we advocate for a position, 
we don't do a justice to our case if we ignore some of the concerns. They are very legitimate concerns that people have about young people um, using, young people abusing anything, whether it's alcohol or, or a variety of drugs that are widely available to them. Um, so I, I don't think we should dismiss these concerns. But I think as Juan Manuel uh, very eloquently expressed, most people would like to prevent their children from using any kind of substance. But if they do, they would rather have them looked after properly rather than imprisoned or even just have a criminal record that would think their future. At the same time, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that in young people's community, the fact that a product is legal will make it more attractive. Frankly, in fact, one could argue that it might be the opposite. There's a big debate that, as to what is the cutoff age. You know, is 2018, 21 the right cutoff line for accessing legal product? Um, it may very well be in fact that even if young people cannot purchase cannabis in the legalized market, they may in fact end up purchasing indirectly products that come from the legal market in which they can see exactly the pro proportion of THC and CBD and the other characteristic of the product rather than be contaminated uh, by very dangerous substances that are, that are very bad for their health. So all in all, I think it is a concern. How to address it, um, I think, is certainly not by a continuation of criminal prosecution. Mm. Thank you. And maybe we should give young people some credit here too. I, I don't know if these findings are echoed for um, all drugs, but I certainly, I was listening to a Radio New Zealand podcast yesterday about the fact that alcohol use by young people has actually been consistently down um, for uh, over the last 20 years. And so the um, some of the patterns and trends amongst young people's use of drugs and alcohol are um, signaling less harmful use than perhaps when someone like myself was young. <laughs> um, to move to um, another area of question, a number of people in the Q&A have raised um, the question asking about clarification between what we mean when we talk about decriminalisation and what we mean when we talk about legalisation. What the difference is between these two and why in particular we we in New Zealand are having a referendum about full legalization um, and why I guess for the purposes of this panel that's the favored option against decriminalization. Um, so perhaps um, it might be interesting to hear particularly from Louise and Jeff who have um, yeah. been in jurisdictions who have experimented with yeah. both of those models um, but, but from anyone who has a comment about that also. Can I, can I just set the New Zealand context for our, our friends off, offshore? Uh, and often at the Drug Commission, when we've discussed this, we make the obvious point that decriminalisation doesn't deal with the issue of supply. So it doesn't deal with Churchill's comment. If you decriminalise but leave the supply illegal, well, the, the, the illegal market makes the profits, not the state treasury, as Churchill uh, reminded the, the, the Americans all those years ago. Uh, so you, you haven't really dealt with the issue. Now, the second point of, of context is that in New Zealand last year, there was a Misuse of Drugs Amendment Act passed. And that was very much in line with the Prime Minister's opinion, which I share, that uh, drugs need to be dealt with as a health and social issue, as not, not a criminal issue. So the amendment to the law uh, should have, in effect, decriminalised use and possession, possession of an amount considered personal use. But uh, in the political horse trading that goes on in our parliament, like other parliaments, a clause was put in that bill, which said uh, the, the police have a directive not to arrest or prosecute for use or possession, unless, unless they consider it in the public interest to do so. You know what? We've now had the first results uh, looking at how the rate of arrest and conviction for use and possession before the passage of the bill compares with the experience over the last nine months to a year. The rate of arrest and conviction has not dropped at all. In other words, the law's a flop. It should have sent uh, people down a health and social uh, route. 
it didn't because the police still found ways to, to use the law uh, for a range of, of, of reasons and purposes. And that brings them into dis disrespect, unfortunately, which is not a, a good thing in, in society. So decriminalization really doesn't deal with the, the issue, most certainly doesn't deal with it with cannabis. And as I, I say, until I'm a correct record, that this is this is not a drug that's in the league of alcohol or tobacco, and there's simply no reason for treating it uh, as a highly dangerous drug that, that needs uh, super controls around. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen. Any of our other panelists wanting to comment on that issue? Can I come in? Please. Um, I think it's a good example of the difference between merely decriminalizing and then moving to legalization and obviously regulation. Every food product, in fact, virtually every product that we consume in our society is somewhat regulated. That includes toothpaste. So when we talk about legalization, nobody suggests a kind of free market. This would be the only product that would not be the subject of any kind of stain control. If I could give you an example, in the last three weeks or so, to, I think, a lot of people surprised, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police called for the decriminalization of personal consumption of all drugs. Very surprising. But no, nobody is suggesting that we're going to have fentanyl shops and heroin, uh, government sales of heroin. So in that particular case, I think you're calling for a real shift to a harm reduction system where personal consumption is seen if it's a, um, seen as a, a public health issue and should be dealt with it by the healthcare system, not the criminal justice system. Their arguments are, I think, very cogent. It frees up resources that are best devolved to um, trying to target the trade, the, the, the sales, the distribution, and not the not focusing all the resources on personal consumption. In the case of cannabis, I think um, the question went beyond not having a criminal record for being found in possession, but also realizing that it is a product widely consumed that will be better produced, distributed, and consumed if it's a subject of regulation. So I think that sort of illustrates a bit the difference between merely decriminalizing certain activity and fully legalizing and regulating the market. In some ways, the distinction could be between, you know, decriminalizing with nothing else, and there's all sorts of consequences and problems that have to be dealt with, and decriminalizing with a view to uh, legally regulating. Because the decriminalization argument, I think, is very important. It was the first one that Helen used tonight, that it's, it's, it's quite inappropriate, actually, uh, to have a, a law which criminalizes the use of uh, cannabis. It's, it's quite wrong, it's unjust, it has all sorts of consequences. And, and at least when you argue for decriminalization, you raise that issue. But when it comes to the detail of, of a good public policy, obviously legal regulation takes you further and does a lot more in terms of getting good outcomes. Thank you. Um, one quick question, perhaps we can address simply to Helen and answer quite quickly, but I think it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on Helen is um, one person has raised the question, you know, New Zealand has a uh, official goal to be smoke free um, by 2025 in terms of tobacco smoke. Um, and the question is, how do we align this with our aim to make cannabis legal? I know you had a lot to do with um, the original Smoke Free Environments Act, Helen. Do you have any thoughts particularly on, on that specific question? Well, we never tried to become tobacco smoke free by banning and criminalizing tobacco. We did it through good public policy and advocacy. Of course, tobacco is a very dangerous drug. Tobacco companies hate you saying it, but it is more addictive and dependence creating than morphine or heroin. And it has this highly carcinogenic uh, effect on, on the lungs, which my understanding is cannabis does not have. Uh, so it's a completely different kettle of fish to use a another uh, metaphor. Uh, we should keep uh, working with our advocacy on uh, persuading people not to smoke tobacco because of the very high risk. But, but here's a key point. None of us sitting here are promoting the use of cannabis. I don't. <laughs> I'm someone who from the time I was a small child had respiratory issues with seeds and dusts and smoke and the rest of it. <laughs> I'd be crazy to be you know, in inhaling things. 
course, there are many other ways of using cannabis products, as, and Louise has spoken a little bit about what's available on the market in, in, in Canada. Uh, but if we legalize and bring the issues out up front, then, then we can talk about, you know, what are the risks of cannabis smoking? You know, if, if you're an asthmatic, probably stay away from it. If you're interested in the product, look for something else. Uh, that doesn't involve that. But it, it's just so different from tobacco smoking, which is so dangerous uh, to, to our lives. Thank you. Um, we've touched on this a little bit already, but given that we've had a number of questions about it, I think I'd like to put it specifically to the panel as well. Um, people raising questions about how we can ensure that following legalisation, uh, we don't continue to see very harmful black market or um, another formulation of a similar question. How do we get the, the regulations for the industry uh, that will emerge as a result of legalization? Uh, in the, get, how do we get those settings in the right place so that we don't inadvertently um, grow, I guess, the, the um, the, the black market by, by setting the um, restrictions too strictly, for example. Um, we, I know some of our earlier discussions touched on this issue of organised crime and the black market, but um, any, any comment in particular about how we get those settings right to try to limit the, uh, the availability of, a, of an illegal black market following legalisation? Well, um, the, yes. the fight against organised crime has to be a, a comprehensive approach, has to have a comprehensive approach. Organized crime is also transsectoral. It's not only drugs, it, the organized crime controls other type of illicit business. So if you take the profits out of the drug business, you're going to weaken the whole structure of organized crime. You might not do away with it, but certainly you can weaken it, and uh, uh, it's very it's very logical and easy to understand that the huge profits that are made, for example, uh, from what a peasant receives in Colombia by growing uh, marijuana, and uh, what uh, that marijuana is uh, uh, the value of that marijuana when it reaches. Uh, the United States or of other drugs, it's very easy to understand that if you take away from the organized crime that amount of money, simply the, the, the organization will collapse. And we have done that in Colombia in, in, in many ways, uh, but uh, the problem is that because of prohibition, the profits are huge. And so the, the, if you chop the head of an organized crime, immediately it is replaced. So the only way to take away the strength of the organized crime is to take away the incentive for profit. And when the, the state acquires that control, then there's no room for the organized crime to continue. And, and, and I, will, I will finish with one, one uh, uh, argument uh, for legalization. Uh, it's a collateral, a collateral uh, uh, effect of, of prohibition. And I know that uh, in New Zealand, you are very, very much aware and very uh, preoccupied as the rest of the world with climate change and uh, with what is happening in the world in terms of uh, uh, the world uh, becoming uh, very dangerous because of climate change. Organized crime. Prohibition has a direct effect on organized crime, and organized crime is in very much, in, in many ways, responsible, for example, during this pandemic, for the deforestation of the Amazon and many areas in the world. And that, I can uh, link it directly to prohibition. And uh, that is another argument for organization, uh, part of the collateral damage that prohibition does. <laughs> Well, that is fascinating and not an argument that I've ever heard before, um, but really interesting to think about in that context of climate change. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions particularly related to Indigenous populations, both 
um, asking for more um, more illustration of exactly how it is that Indigenous or First Nations populations are discriminated against under the status quo, um, and also whether there's any evidence of benefits to those populations from in, in jurisdictions where law reform has taken place. So uh, would any of you like particularly to comment on, on that question? Well, just to put the, you know, the figures out there uh, for the public, uh, the last full year I've seen figures four on uh, charging and conviction on cannabis offences was 2018. And there were just under 4,000 people who were charged and just under uh, just over 3,000 who were convicted. So there was actually a success conviction rate by the police of, of around 75%. Um, now, 41% of those convicted were Maori. Maori, Indigenous people in our country, make up 15% of the population. So you can see how grossly disproportionate it, it, it is. Uh, in 2018, 306 people in New Zealand went to jail for cannabis offences. So a lot of them are not, are not being jailed, uh, but they do have the stigma of a conviction, which carries a, a range of, of consequences. Now, in New Zealand, uh, Māori populations are very significant in the Northland, uh, Bay of Plenty, Waikato, and East Coast uh, rural areas. Uh, cannabis is widely grown in those areas, and I would have huge hopes for economic development and bringing people who are able to grow uh, to the quality standards into the legal economy. We've seen what this has done. Uh, for poor rural communities on the west coast of uh, the United States, for example. And I think we could see those benefits here. <coughs> so making uh, an honest living uh, from legalized cannabis, I think will be very, very positive uh, for Māori communities in those, those parts of, of New Zealand. Uh, when you were speaking, Holly, I was thinking of um, Canadian indigenous communities sometimes living in, in very cold places. So you may need the community greenhouse for the cannabis there, but uh, probably in, in British Columbia, uh, with a more, in uh, Vancouver Island with a more clement climate, there, there could be some real prospects there, I suggest. I think in, a, in the Australian context, there's definitely ex evidence to show that uh, a bad law can lead to bad practice when it comes to indigenous people. A recent study in New South Wales showed that, uh, and they have, we have a cautioning system in this particular state. Under the cautioning system, uh, uh, the difference between what happened to an Aboriginal person uh, and what happened to a non-Indigenous person is very, very significant. Most uh, Aboriginal people were pushed into the criminal justice system as a result of their apprehension. 50% uh, non-Indigenous, 80% Indigenous. So bad law allows bad practice. And I think uh, in, in terms of uh, our cannabis laws, they are bad laws uh, because of the injustices built into them and, and they, they can facilitate prejudice behaviour uh, in their administration. Can I come in on yes, the other yes. Yeah. I don't know if you can still hear me. Something here says your internet connection is unstable. So if I disappear, just ignore me. We can hear you fine for now. <laughs> I just want maybe to come back on a couple of issues. Uh, we have exactly the same issue in Canada, as I mentioned earlier, the over-representation of Indigenous people across the board with relation to virtually every uh, criminal offence, uh, disproportionate uh, targeting by law enforcement. And I think we're just now starting to understand what we really mean by systemic discrimination, that it's not always the deliberate targeting of particular communities or people, but it's an entire system that is geared to that. And that brings me back to the comment that Helen made earlier about prosecutorial or, or law enforcement discretion. It's a very bad idea uh, in general terms, unless that discretion is extremely curtailed and there are very strict guidelines, it's eminently predictable uh, how this discretion will be enforced if it's, if it's applied at all. Um, it's asking too much, I think, uh, to people who are not, uh, who need to be guide, guided. So it's much better, I think, not to go down this route. And I just want to make one final comment with respect to, you know, how to eradicate the monopoly, in a sense, that currently criminal organized uh, organizations and criminal activities have on the cannabis market. This is really a dilemma, I think, for the government in regulating on the one hand, 
in invading that market enough to <clears throat> squeeze out the criminals and therefore you know making the prices competitive making the products more attractive for instance you could get more organic cannabis than the stuff you buy from in a brown paper bag that you don't know where it comes from doing all that without of course being on a campaign encouraging consumption that's not as helen said that is not the point so it's a little bit of a dilemma uh, i think but slowly um as i said the market share in canada doesn't seem to have increased at all but it's a question of redistributing it and there again i think indigenous communities uh, may actually be less targeted for prosecution in consumption and could find activities in the growing and distribution. Um, so I think that's the benefit of moving to legalization and regulation. Thank you. I'm, I'm very sorry to say that we're nearly getting towards a time we need to draw things to a close, which um, is unfortunate because it's been a, a fascinating discussion and we do still have a number of unanswered questions. So my apologies to the, those whose questions we haven't been able to get to. I'm, I'm going to hand back to Carly in a minute to make some concluding comments, but before we do, I would just love to go around each one of the panelists and perhaps if you could answer this very quickly in, in one minute or less. Um, but for each of you, for anybody who is listening, who is still undecided about how to vote, and this might also apply, several people have asked us what they should say to their friends or relatives who are still undecided. So this can help to answer that question too. It, what would you say to anyone listening? What's the one thing um, you'd like them to take away at the end of this discussion if they are still feeling undecided about how to vote? Perhaps we'll go around the panel and we could start with you, Helen. Okay. I have to unmute, unmute myself. Uh, what I would say to all the parents and grandparents uh, listening is think of your children and your grandchildren. Would you want them to be among those thousands who are uh, arrested and convicted each year? No, because they're not doing something uh, that is is bad. Uh, if I'd be more concerned, frankly, if my great nieces and nephews were taking up tobacco smoking. Uh, so I think we just need to deal with this in a rational and, and calm way. Uh, people are using it now. They will continue to use it. We can treat them like criminals or we can treat them like human beings and say that people use these things for various reasons in their lives. Many do, but let's not criminalize them. I'd, I'd take that very much human-centered approach, uh, looking at it from the perspective of parents, uh, grandparents and a, a great aunt and, uh, as I am myself. Mm. Thank you. Jeff? I think I'd take a slightly different angle. I, I agree exactly with uh, what Helen said in terms of the argument. But I think what I'd like to say to, to New Zealand people, uh, you know, you've got a real chance here to do something that's very important. Uh, it, it would make New Zealand yet again a leader in terms of the positions it takes. Uh, I think there's a strong argument for it, but a particular argument backing that up is New Zealand, take a lead show us that we can have a better way to deal with these issues. We can knock off the prejudice, we can knock off the stigma, we can knock off the fundamentalism and actually deal with people as they are and improve their lives and, and set an example to the rest of the world. Mm, thank you. Juan Manuel? Well, I, I agree with uh, what was just said. Uh, New Zealand is giving the world uh, an example of how to deal, for example, with the pandemic and they can give us an example of how to deal with a problem that has been with us for many, many years. The world declared the war on drugs more than 50 years ago. It's a war that has not been won, therefore it has been lost. And the only way to win this war is to abolish prohibition. And in the case of New Zealand, to vote yes for legalization of marijuana. Thank you. And Louise? Well, I think I would certainly echo what's been said, I think, from all these different angles. Uh, it's critical, I think, in a rational, democratic society like that of New Zealand, to have public policies that make sense, that are science-based. Um, and on this one, I think the evidence is absolutely clear. The so-called war on drugs has been a catastrophic failure. It hasn't attained any of its objectives. The, uh, regulation of 
use of cannabis, I think, uh, does not increase use, has every chance of reducing the harms that may come from abusive uh, or abuse of the drug, and will take away all the harm that comes from the abuse of, of a criminal produces so little harm. So it's clearly, clearly a rational step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. I certainly feel, um, I feel an injection of motivation and inspiration from hearing you all. And I hope that everyone listening has as well. And um, that we're all going away from uh, this today's discussion, feeling um, really armed as well with some of the, uh, uh, the arguments and the information that might be useful in the conversations we'll be having with the people in our own lives about the referendum. So, um, for me to conclude, I just want to thank all of our panelists so very, very much. It's been an honor for me to um, be able to facilitate a discussion with such a distinguished panel, and it's been really excellent and informative. So thank you very, very much for your time. Um, and I'll now hand back to Carly, who's going to make some concluding comments before we end the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. And um, just looking at the comments there, I can see everyone is um, really uh, reflecting those thoughts back that it's been a really wonderful discussion and a great honour to have um, our wonderful panellists on board. So thank you so much. I don't have time to um, I don't have time to um, summarise everything that everyone said, but I wanted to just bring out a few key things that I heard that really um, sunk in for me. So uh, when Helen talked, I was really heartened to hear her say that social justice is the key reason to legalise for her. Um, that's certainly also how I feel about it. Um, there are far too many convictions every year and the impact of, of that is really is not great in New Zealand, especially for, for Māori and for young people. So thanks, Helen. And I also really enjoyed your comment that this is not about deciding if cannabis should be available because it really already is available. This is about putting some controls around it. Um, Louise, I um, loved your call for the, the return to sober science-based policy. If only we could, could have that all around, that would be excellent. Um, and you talked about how a science-based approach really requires us to look more widely at the impacts of um, of engaging the criminal justice, justice system to treat what is actually in effect in a, a health issue. Um, really valuable comments there from, from a judge, previous judge. So um, I also loved your comment that legalization in, in Canada of cannabis was a, the non-event of the year. That really says it all for me. Um, it, it, all this fear and hype um, and then it was actually just a, a, a not a huge event. The sky did not fall in. So I, I think that's what we would have here as well. Um, Juan Man Manuel, thank you um, very much. I think you really put it nicely in the international context for us in terms of how um, you know the sobering situation. Have, how Colombia has really um, paid the the highest price for the war on drugs in the world, um, and how this relates to our situation here in New Zealand. Um, and you mentioned that uh, legalisation can really take away the strength from organised crime by removing the profit incentive, sure. and that's a really wonderful lesson for us to think about. To think about here. Um, and Jeff, I also really enjoyed how you talked about um, how this is really just about how we approach public policy. Do we focus on evidence or do we focus on fear? And you talked about how there's been no radical increase um, in use in Western Australia since law changes there um, and that the fear campaign was proved wrong. So I think that's really important for us to think about. Um, you also said a great quote, there's no such thing as a perfect world, but there is a better world. And I think people yeah. often uh, turn to us to, uh, who are proposing change to justify how we're gonna solve every imaginable problem relating to cannabis and that's not really the point. It's what can we do currently under prohibition to solve those problems? Well, I think we're pretty clear that we can do very little to solve those problems under prohibition. What we can do is move gradually towards a better world by putting some great controls in there. So thank you to all of you for your for your wonderful comments. Um, I just before we finish, um, I'm conscious of the time, but I really wanted to quickly say that um, there's so many things that everyone who's been listening today can do to help this debate. Um, I think it's really important that you get out there and have conversations with as many people as you can about legalization. Um, the, the referendum's still on a knife edge. We don't know how it's gonna go. It's looking positive, but we don't wanna count our chickens. So we need everyone to get out there and start really having conversations. We need to make sure you're enrolled, that your friends are enrolled, um, especially that any young people in your life are enrolled because they're not, they're not enrolling at the great rates. And we know that even if they are enrolled, uh, a uh, at least a third of them may not turn up to vote. So really important that you take some young people to the election booth this year, please. Um, 
and also that you let your expat um, friends and family know that they can vote from overseas and that it's really easy as well to do that. And finally, um, just a pitch, we are, um, it's expensive to run a campaign. Um, we'd love to see as many ads as possible in the news on the media, um, TV and in newspapers. So um, uh, we're still taking donations to cover that. And um, if you feel strongly about this, please do consider um, donating. And I see there has been, yes, the um, link to that donation has been put on the on the chat there. So just once again, thank you so much to everyone. This has been very valuable. We really appreciate you tuning in from around the world at all hours uh, to have this conversation with us. And we hope that we'll be able to report back to you later a successful world leading verdict at the referendum. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Have a great day, evening, night. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Very well. Thank you.